So what were the early questions on biotechnology? So one of the earliest decisions on in this area which opened floodgates of patent applications in the area of biotechnology was decided by the US Supreme Court in 1980. This is the famous Diamond versus Chakrabarti decision. The question in this case was whether a genetically modified organism produced by the defendant was patentable or not. In this case, Anand Chakrabarti, the scientist, invented a, a genetically modified organism which was able to break crude oil. So when there were oil spills and if these organisms were released in the wild, this could actually break the crude oil and settle it down. This was a great invention of that point in that point of time. And it went up to the Supreme Court. Justice Berger wrote the decision and the question before the court was a very narrow one. What is the interpretation that must be given to patentable subject matter as it is, as it appears in 35 U.S.C. 101, which says, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful purpose, machine, manufacture or composition of matter or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent therefore subject to the conditions and requirement of this title. So the question was whether a genetically modified organism as invented by Ananda Chakravarti would fall in either a machine, a manufacture, a composition of matter or any useful improvement thereof. So the court said we have been cautioned that we should not read into patent laws limitations and conditions which the legislature has not expressed. In choosing such expansive terms as manufacture, composition of matter, modified the comprehensive with the comprehensive any, the court said Congress plainly contemplated that patent laws should be given wider scope. In fact, the court went on to make a finding that the Congress has intended patented subject, patent subject matter to include anything under the sun that is made by man. And finally judged in the light of the respondent's microorganism, it plainly qualifies as a patentable subject matter, that's what the court said, is claim to a non-naturally occurring manufacture or composition of matter is a product of human ingenuity. But there was a huge dissent to this particular case. In dissent, the judge said, the patent laws attempt to reconcile these notions, deep-seated antipathy to monopoly, with the need to encourage progress. Given the complexity and legislative nature of this delicate task, we must be careful to extend patent protection no further than the Congress has provided. In particular, where there was an absence of legislative intention or direction, the court should leave to the Congress the decisions whether and how far to extend the patent privilege into areas where the common understanding has been that patents are not available. The court also further on went on to record its dissent by stating, first the acts evidence Congress's understanding that at least in 1930 that 101 does not include living organisms. If newly developed living organisms non-naturally occurring had been patentable under 101, the, pl the plants including in the scope of the 1930 Act and the 1970 Act which provides plant patents could have been patented without a new legislation. Those plants like the bacteria involved in this case were new varieties not naturally occurring. So the dissent seems to stick on what should be the legislative interpretation or, or the judicial interpretation of the legislative intention from the perspective of patentable subject matter when the dissent says that these new modern biotechnological inventions was anyway not envisaged and that was the reason why in 1930s and 70s when the Congress, the US Congress sought to extend it to uh, subject matters that were not naturally occurring, that, that were not naturally occurring, they actually extended it through special legislations and hence the patent law should be narrowly construed. While at the same time, the majority decision goes on with the formula that 
Anyway, the Congress has already into, already provided us with the Act, that is Section 101, with reference to patentable subject matter, without any restriction with reference to its ability, the ability of the judges to interpret it broadly, because anyway, technology changes over a period of time, and the biotech industry has grown, and hence, to provide certain level of protection to such products, patent law must be expanded to include these. As a result of this decision, post Diamond versus Chakrabarti, the US Patent Office implemented them through the guidelines and started accepting patent applications. But it is important to record one of the older decisions, that is a 1948 decision in Funk Brothers versus Callow in Auckland, where the US Supreme Court in this case held that a trivial implementation of a natural principle or phenomena of nature is not eligible for a patent. In this case, the patentee had discovered that there were strains of each species of root nodule bacteria which do not exert a mutually inhibitive effect on each other. Thus, he was able to provide a mixed culture of ribosia capable of inoculating plants belonging to several groups. The Supreme Court held, and that was the majority opinion as per Justice Douglas, it held that the properties of inhibition or of non-inhibition in the bacteria were the work of nature and therefore not subject to being patented. To quote, it said, patents cannot issue for the discovery of phenomena of nature. The court added, the qualities of this bacteria like heat of the sun, electricity or the qualities of metals are part of the storehouse of knowledge of all men. They are manifestations of the laws of nature, free to all men and reserved exclusively to none. He who discovers a hitherto unknown phenomena of nature has no claim to a monopoly in which the law recognizes. If there is to be an invention from such discovery, it must come from the application of the law of nature to a new and useful end. The court seems to have relied on an interpretation that favors a, 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 a situation where even those properties which were newly discovered by the patent applicant should not be patentable. This is this position was substantially changed by the decision of Diamond versus Chakrabarti in 1980, post which patents in biotechnology were a common phenomenon. Now, on the other side of the Atlantic, that is in Europe, Europe had to deal with certain challenges, initial challenges. In the Relaxin case, in around 1995, where the invention related to claims concerning DNA sequences of naturally occurring substance that relaxes the uterus of a woman, of a pregnant woman during childbirth, which was obtained from human ovary. Now, in this case, there were a lot of questions that were uh, raised in relation to patentability, both in terms of uh, um, novelty, inventive step, industrial application, and also subject matter exclusions. Now, the EPO has granted a patent in which the claim one of the particular patent application read as follows, a DNA fragment encoding human H2 preproxylin and H2 preproxylin having the amino acid sequence set out in a particular figure that is appended with the patent application. The EPO opposition division upheld the invention and remarked that it was not a discovery by following the EPO guidelines and it said, substance relaxin has not been previously recognized although occurring in nature, that a process has been developed to obtain relaxin and DNA which encoded it that the product were characterized by their chemical structure and that product has a use. Now, this decision in relaxin actually opened up a lot of issues relating to both ethical and legal dimensions of patent eligibility in Europe. In a subsequent decision pertaining to uh, animal varieties, what animals and animal varieties were excluded by the European Patent Convention was an important question. So the exclusion of plant varieties can be based on a fact that there is, a, there is different or there are different sui generis legislation, but what about animals? In this case, the Howard Onkomaus decision, Howard Onkomaus is a genetically modified organism 
which was already patented in the United States, but the question of whether it would be patentable under Article 53 of the European Patent Convention was a question. Specifically, the exclusion sought to be construed narrowly was under Article 53B and whether it did bar or not animals in general. Article 53B read, plants or animal varieties are essentially biological processes for the production of plants or animals and that this provision shall not be or shall not apply to micro, microbiological processes or products thereof. So the exclusion seems to be pretty much clear that plant or animal varieties are not are to be excluded and not provided patents. Now the, the, the case went on appeal and finally the conclusion was that there were three versions of European Patent Convention where in the use of different wording for animal varieties, varieties, species, races and that this different classification can lead to certain kind of difficulties in interpretation for, from a tax, taxonomic perspective. The EPO board bypassed the three variants and said that the claim was for transgenic rodents and not for something that was natural, a taxonomic category higher than species, varieties and race. It means article 53b in case of animal variety exclusion will only apply when the claim is for a single animal variety. Now the wording used in Indian context in as we shall see in section 3j in the Indian context is important because plant and animals in whole and part including seeds, varieties and species are excluded from the act and we shall see what can be the consequences of the application of this decision in, in the Indian context. What about plants and plant variety? Now the Europeans have a directive in this regard and directive 29 that is the biotechnology directive states whereas the directive is without prejudice to the exclusion of plant and animal varieties from patentability whereas on the other hand inventions which concern plants or animals are patentable provided the application of the invention is not technically confined to a single plant or animal variety. Now one of the applications that is Siva Gegi's application wherein claims direct towards plant propagating material that has been chemically treated so as to make the material resistant to other agricultural chemicals whether or not these claims were directed to a plant or plant variety. Now plant breeding introduced a trait into plants that reappeared in subsequent generations. This did not occur with chemical treatment hence claim for claims are not for plant varieties that was one of the contentions. Similar re reasoning adopted in the plant genetic systems case. Now article 1-2 also says that inventions which concern plant or animals shall be patentable if the technical feasibility of the invention is not confined to a particular plant or animal variety. So there are other provisions that clarify the case laws prior to this directive and that is the reason why the application was allowed. Now what are essentially biological processes that are excluded? It applies only to processes and not to products that is very important because these are related to essentially biological processes. Offsprings of GMA, GMOs that is genetically modified organisms would be considered as products even if they were produced out of essentially biological process. It means self-replicating seeds, self-replicating plants which produce seeds. Seeds of such plants would be covered by the patent precisely because of the reason that these are, although these are produced out of essentially biological processes but they were produced through uh, as GMOs. Now what is essentially biological? Article 1 of the directive says the process of for the production of plant and animals is essentially biological if it consists entirely of a natural phenomena such as crossing or selection. So how much of human intervention is needed to make an otherwise biological process non-biological? In this case there is a very famous test when decided in Librizol by the European uh, quotes, it said, judged on the basis of the essence of the invention, taking into account the totality of human intervention and its impact on the results achieved, we shall try and see whether a process is either essentially biological or not. Now value judgment is needed, what do you mean by technicality being the criterion and how that has to be manifested in the invention in relation to an essentially biological process that distinguishes it from an essentially non-biological process is what needs to be looked into. Now microbiological process can't be excluded and this is the position in the TRIPS mandate as we shall see in our next few slides 
and also the position in Indian law. In the PGS case, it is a plant genetic systems case, a process in which microorganisms are used to make or modify plants. Here the process where new microorganisms are developed for specific uses. So what is a microbiological process? A microbiological process is presumably one that is carried out by microorganisms, but as a microorganism is ill-defined, so too is a microbiological bi process. What would the word microorganism mean in the context of Indian Act? And we shall try and see that when we discuss the Indian position. No definition and hence there is still a lot of scope for deciding. There are various possibilities of reading the same. Could it be only restricted to genetically modified organisms or microorganisms that needs to be seen.